Well, thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. You know, it's really an honor to be a, a part of this series of uh, SID talks focused on targeted therapies. Um, you know, truth be told, though, however, being, in this, being up in front of an audience as a Dana-Farber faculty member is a position that through most of my training I never pictured for myself. You know, as Barrett just told you, I'm a, I'm a synthetic chemist, and, you know, I've really known since early in my training, you know, back when I was an undergraduate in Ohio, that I wanted to work in the area of drug discovery. So most chemists that want to work in the area of drug discovery, after they've finished a, you know, PhD and a postdoc, they look for jobs at a company like Novartis or maybe a Merck, a small biotech, but typically not at a hospital. So in 2010, I was a couple years into a, a postdoc at the Broad Institute over in Cambridge when I started to think about looking for a job at a big pharma company. Um, and as I started to look around, I noticed a posting for medicinal chemist at Dana-Farber. So at the time, I didn't really, you know, know what to think about this job posting. Um, you know, going back to when I was an undergraduate in Ohio, it was during that time that uh, Gleevec, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that inactivates a translocation that causes chronic myelogenous leukemia, was approved. Um, you know, th this therapy, Gleevec, it really revolutionized the treatment of, of this cancer CML. And, you know, it was really was a key driving force of increased research focused on developing medicines that were tailored to the genetics of an individual patient. And so, you know, it was this story and others like it that I followed through the rest of my training that had me really excited to work in cancer, you know, personalized cancer medicine. Um, and so from that point of view, the Dana-Farber job was really intriguing. I'd definitely be working in, you know, developing novel targets for, uh, you know, different causes of cancer that had been discovered at, you know, a great institute like Dana-Farber. Um, but on the other hand, I was asking myself, since when does Dana-Farber do drug discovery? And so as Barrett, uh, you know, just mentioned, what I came to find out was that back in 2010, uh, Dana-Farber was just a few years into an experiment in cancer chemical biology or drug discovery chemistry. We use the terms pretty interchangeably. Um, and the real hypothesis, uh, you know, of this experiment was that if they had drug discovery chemists localized with scientists that discover the, the causes of cancer and the scientists that uh, evaluate prototype drugs and preclinical models, um, that they'd be in a position to more quickly advance the discoveries of the genetic basis of cancers um, to drugs that are in the clinic. Um, and so this experiment, it started out small. Uh, they hired three chemistry faculty, and a couple years later, they opened a medicinal chemistry core lab. So it was a staff scientist position in that lab that I had saw a job posting for, and, you know, I did join that group, and I'll talk uh, about my, a little bit more about my role in that group in just a moment. Um, but, you know, it was about seven or eight years into this experiment, I guess it would have been, you know, 2013, 2014, um, that the success of these first three faculty members was just, you know, exceeding, I think, most people's, uh, you know, wildest expectations. Um, just to give you a few quick statistics, uh, this group of three faculty now employed over 60 scientists. They had published over 300 uh, scientific papers. They licensed more than 30 of their patents and started eight drug companies, resulting in one compound uh, that was already, one drug that was already approved, uh, two more in clinical trials, and several more that were close to, to entering the clinic. And so really, you know, based on the success of the first few chemistry faculty at Dana-Farber, uh, they decided to double the size of the program. They hired three new chemistry faculty, my, myself being one of them, um, and we recently moved into, uh, you know, state-of-the-art lab space uh, in Longwood Center building on the corners of Brookline Avenue, uh, Brookline and Longwood Avenues over on the Longwood campus. Um, and so in 2010, when I first joined Dana-Farber, one of the first projects that I worked on was a collaboration with uh, Professor Steve Trion, who's a physician scientist at Dana-Farber and the world's expert on a rare B-cell lymphoma uh, named Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Um, and so about five or six years ago, Steve had uncovered the genetic basis for this particular cancer, which is a mutation in a, an adapter protein that's named MITE88. Um, so any time when, you know, a new... Uh, <clears throat> A discovery is made on the new molecular basis of cancer. The first question is, can we develop a drug that targets that particular mutation? And so when Steve approached a handful of uh, us, us chemists at Dana-Farber with this question, unfortunately, you know, our answer was, it might be no in this case, or at least it's going to be extraordinarily difficult. Um, because this MITE88 protein, it falls into a category of drug targets that we um, often refer to as undruggable because they don't have a, you know, a nice cleft for a drug to bind. You can think of it just similar to, you know, how a key would bind a lock. Um, so, you know, an alternative approach in these types of cases is to look for a target that can be readily drugged, that this uh, hard-to-drug uh, mutant enzyme is utilizing to signal to the cancer cell to grow out of control and be cancerous. And so in this particular case, um, Steve's lab, a, quickly discovered that there was a drug that was already in clinical trials, a drug named abrutinib uh, that targets a kinase BTK, 
um, that blocked signaling of this mutant MITE88 protein um, by inhibiting this BTK enzyme that functions downstream. And so a clinical trial was rapidly initiated, and in 2015, abrutinib was approved for the treatment of Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. I mean, it's a really great therapy for this cancer. Uh, patients show responses, and from what Steve tells me, they feel great. Um, there are minimal side effects, as you would hope to see with a targeted therapy. Um, but the, the truth of the matter was, at the end of the day, uh, there were not uh, complete responses, and so more work needed to be done. Um, and so this is where, you know, I started collaborating closely with Steve to discover, you know, well, let me just uh, kind of take a step back, you know, keeping in mind that abrutinib had not been designed for Waldenstrom's, rather it had been repurposed, you know, we wanted to ask the question, what really are the best therapies uh, for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia? Um, so to summarize a lot of work, we discovered that there was a kinase, the name's HCK, uh, that mutant mite 88 cells relied upon uh, for survival. Um, so we went into the lab, we made over, you know, 200, 300 compounds uh, to develop very potent inhibitors of this target, HCK, and we're able to show in preclinical models that they very potently killed Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, in fact, even more potently than abrutinib, which was already in the clinic. We further fine-tuned these compounds so that they were orally bioavailable, and we were able to show that they uh, were safe in preclinical toxicology models. And once we, you know, advanced the project to this point, uh, we licensed the intellectual property of the compounds to a startup company that is further advancing uh, these novel compounds towards the clinic. I mean, I did just want to mention that while Waldenstrom's, it, you know, is considered an orphan disease, uh, there are a large subset of lymphoma patients that harbor this same mutation, so the newly developed drugs for this particular malignancy have the potential to impact a much wider range of patients. You know, so it was, it was this project, as well as, you know, several others that, you know, made it really difficult for me to make the decision to leave this medicinal chemistry core lab at Dana-Farber. But after a few years, you know, I knew that it was, it was time for me to move on. Um, and I think I surprised even myself when I didn't apply to a, you know, single job at Novartis or at Merck, um, but rather I was writing uh, research proposals to pursue an independent academic career. You know, the opportunity to work at Dana-Farber and collaborate you know, with all the disease experts really opened my eyes to, you know, the real impact that academic drug discovery can have on patient care. Um, I, furthermore, I really became interested in a field of study uh, known as protein degradation, and I wanted to be able to dedicate more of my time to this particular area. Um, so, you know, I conducted a nationwide search to look for a faculty position, um, and I was, uh, you know, very thrilled when I received the offer from Dana-Farber. I knew it was the, you know, the right fit for me um, to join the faculty here and be able to, you know, continue to work uh, with a great group of investigators. Um, so when I was talking about the Waldenstrom's project, you know, I mentioned this problem of undruggable or very challenging to target uh, uh, proteins that we often encounter in cancer. And so my independent lab is really focused on a novel method of going after these types of targets that focuses on promoting their degradation, so just eliminating them completely. Um, you know, protein turnover, synthesis, and degradation of proteins is part of the normal process of maintaining cell health. Um, when it's time for a protein to be degraded, machinery within a cell, they put a tag on it um, that tells it to be degraded. Um, but recently, we've you know, come to realize that there are family of enzymes that can remove these tags. And really relevant to the discussion this morning, um, this family of enzymes, they're called d ubiquinase enzymes. And they can promote tumorigenesis by removing these degradative tags from different oncogenic proteins. So the real mission of my group is to develop uh, first-in-class uh, inhibitors and prototype drugs that target these deubiquinase enzymes so that we can validate them in collaboration with a number of disease experts at, at Dana-Farber as potential novel therapy um, for different malignancies in which they're really one of the, in which they're stabilizing the different oncogenic proteins that are driving that particular cancer. Um, and so, you know, just uh, in closing, back in 2010, when I, you know, saw this job posting for medicinal chemist at Dana-Farber, I asked around to my chemistry friends, uh, do you know anything about drug discovery at Dana-Farber? Nobody really knew much. And now in 2017, you know, it's a completely different story. Um, you know, I think this is probably most evident um, by the fact that one of the first three chemistry faculty, um, Jay Bradner, has been recruited to be president of the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. Um, you know, Dana-Farber really has built a one-of-a-kind uh, program in uh, cancer chemical biology. I think, you know, the accomplishments of the first three faculty are, are just staggering. And, you know, I'm really excited to see now as a bigger group what we can collectively accomplish, uh, you know, in the coming years. And so thank you to everybody uh, for your support of our research in this endeavor.